we're very happy to have uh, Leon Valence from KITP as our next speaker, and you can see his title on your screen. Leon? Yeah. Okay, so you are seeing the screen. Great. Yep. Um, so it's, uh, you know, as usual in these things, it's uh, nice to, it's a pleasure to be invited to this, uh, this beautiful place right here and enjoy all your company. Um, so uh, uh, this is going to be a, a bit of a, a, a change from the previous talk, um, uh, but there is some connection. Of course, this is all in the framework of the uh, Ultra Quantum Matter Simons collaboration. And um, here uh, I'll be talking as Sabir did about systems which have fractionalization, but um, in contrast to that, uh, we'll be talking about systems in which there are quasi-particles. The quasi-particles just are uh, a bit more exotic. They're fractional. Um, and uh, the, the focus here is on how to, um, uh, how to detect them. Uh, and in particular, uh, uh, I want to emphasize that there are some important uh, interaction effects. Um, so, Shamit, I hope you'll uh, kind of keep me to time. And I'm not sure what the schedule is since we're running late. But uh, I will absolutely warn you at 10 minutes, 5 and 2. Okay, super. Um, so, this is uh, just supposed to show you some, uh, some types of quasi-particles scattering off of one another. These are the type of effects we'll be interested in for uh, a more physics-y quasi-particles. Um, okay, so let's make sure. Here we go. Uh, so this is work done with two collaborators. Uh, Oleg Starik is an old friend of mine. Um, we've been collaborating for many years on various problems in quantum magnetism, and Anna Kesselman is a postdoc at KTP. Um, so this is the plan. I'm going to talk a bit about quasi-particles, and in particular quasi-particles in spin liquids, uh, which is the original motivation for this study. Um, and then I will talk about um, focus on a particular spin liquid, the one actually that Sabir talked about, the uh, Fermi surface coupled to a gauge field, what I'll call the spin-on Fermi surface state. Um, but uh, the difference will be that we'll study it in the presence of a small Zeeman field. Um, we're not looking for uh, uh, non-Fermi liquid behavior in particular. We're going to identify a specific spectral feature that's directly connected to a particular type of interaction uh, in that system. Um, in particular, I want to I'll just uh, share the punchline ahead of time. Uh, what we find is that the uh, interactions combined with the effect of a applied magnetic field uh, introduce a gap, a splitting between two branches of what you would call optical modes. Um, and then the, the second part of the talk will be uh, something a little more recent where we realized that uh, a very, very similar physics occurs in 1D uh, quantum spin chains, which is uh, an opportunity because those spin chains uh, can be studied with uh, essentially perfect precision numerically. Uh, so we can really confront our uh, analytical theoretical predictions with uh, you know, numerically exact calculations. So quasi-particles, you know, these are one of the basic notions of, uh, of many-body physics. They're the fundamental excitations of a many-body state. Uh, we call something a quasi-particle if it behaves like a particle. It, a single one of them, isolated from others, should be long-lived, and in particular, its decay rate should be much smaller than its energy. Uh, you know, Landau really uh, clarified the notion uh, of quasi-particles in a metal uh, in his Fermi liquid theory. Um, the way we would look for it, uh, you know, analytically and in an experiment, is to study the one-electron spectral function, what you probe in photo emission, uh, at a fixed uh, momentum as a function of frequency, there should be a, a quasi-particle peak in this uh, spectral function of an electron operator. Um, and that peak uh, should be narrow, so its width should be smaller than its energy. In general, then there's some background on top of that. Um, this talk is mostly focusing on magnetic systems, uh, systems of spins. Uh, before talking about exotic quasi-particles, just it's a good idea to have an idea of what an unexotic quasi-particle is. The simplest thing is, for example, in a ferromagnet, the ground state, all the spins are aligned, but if you flip one spin from up to down, that flip spin can propagate around. That behaves like a particle. Um, the, uh, oops, I went forward. Um, the way you probe it is uh, the object analogous to the one electron spectral function is the dynamical spin susceptibility. That's what's measured in inelastic neutron scattering. It's basically the Fourier transform of the spin-spin correlation function. Um, 
and uh, you can see that it, uh, if the quasi particles are, are, are magnons like this, you get a very sharp peak in the spectral function, and that's seen very, very often in, in ordered magnetic systems uh, like this data here. Um, uh, so there are many examples of exotic quasi-particles. Um, One-dimensional spin chains kind of generically have exotic quasi-particles. If you, if you flip a spin in the center of the spin chain, it will actually uh, decompose into two domain walls that propagate away. Uh, in the fractional quantum Hall effect, um, you have, uh, of course, one-third or, or uh, other fractionally charged quasi-particles. Uh, we'll be talking here about uh, quantum spin liquids, which are two-dimensional, highly entangled, states of, uh, of, of spins, uh, which can have fractional uh, spin one-half fermionic excitations, uh, spin-ons, or other types. Um, very often, uh, these uh, fractional spin-on excitations in spin liquids are described by a, a technology like Sabir employed in the previous talk, a parton decomposition, where you decompose a physical local operator like a spin in terms of a bilinear of, of two uh, to emergent quasi-particles. Here, these would be the spin-on operators. And if you treat them as free, then uh, the correlations of a, of a free, of, a, of the microscopic spins uh, involve two particle continua uh, of these emergent excitations. So this is actually extremely standard popular tool uh, used in uh, trying to model uh, quantum spin liquid states. Um, uh, you know, I've been guilty of it myself, and these are various uh, examples of experimental and theoretical works where uh, people calculate the two particle spectrum. It's very easy to do because you just calculate one, uh, one fermion spectra and convolve it. Um, and you can try to use that as a means of comparison to experiment. Uh, but my consultant here um, uh, tells me uh, that one should be careful um, and uh, one should worry that uh, in general, these emergent quasi-particles, they arose because of interactions. And so uh, those interactions had to be strong to make the par quasi-particles emerge at all. So the quasi-particles themselves should have very strong interactions. Um, and inevitably, those will play a role in physical correlation functions because of uh, what's true of any uh, fractional quasi-particle emergent excitation like this is that any local operator always creates more than one of them at a time. Typically for spin-ons, it creates two of them at a time. They're created nearby in space. They strongly interact at the point of their creation, and that's going to influence their correlations. Um, so to uh, uh, make this uh, sharp, I want to make a very, very simple point about spin correlations. Um, this is something that you might glorify with the name of the Larmor theorem. Um, so very often in studying magnetic systems, uh, uh, one has a Hamiltonian, which is composed of something I'll call H0, contains all the spin interactions. This could also be the Hamiltonian of some field theory description uh, of, our, of our quantum spin liquid state. And we'll assume it has a spin rotational symmetry. So it means quantum mechanically, it commutes with the total spin operator. Now we want to uh, apply a magnetic field to the system, let's say along the Z direction, it couples to the Z uh, component uh, uh, of all the spins. So uh, because of the non-abelian nature of the SU2 symmetry, um, we can now compute the commutator of H with the spin raising and lowering operator, and it only fails to commute with the magnetic field term, uh, uh, has this form, which means that the spin raising and lowering operator is also a raising and lowering operator for the energy. Um, so this implies if you look at the uh, a correlation function, which is basically a time evolving uh, correlation function involving the total spin, and we can do it in frequency. Uh, we, uh, we lower the spin, raise it, and in between measure the energy. Uh, this uh, will be proportional to a delta function uh, of frequency at the Zeeman energy or magnetic field B. Uh, since the spin density at zero momentum is the total spin, this means a dynamical spin susceptibility at zero momentum is proportional to a delta function. Uh, so if we're interested in the dynamical spin susceptibility in the frequency and momentum plane, this Larmor theorem tells us um, that on the vertical axis here uh, uh, at, at k equals zero, this is just, this function is just zero everywhere except a delta function at the magnetic field. So now we can play a game. How do we continue this thing uh, to the, uh, uh, to the rest of this quadrant. Well, it could be that there's a mode coming out of here okay, that disperses and ends at the same energy. 
Um, it could also be that this is the termination of a multi-particle continuum. Um, and in this, uh, you know, in this um, uh, parton mean field theory, this way of calculating correlation functions, uh, this is what you would expect. Okay. So we're going to ask this question, what is this actually for the case of the spin on Fermi surface? This is, uh, as Ashwin mentioned at the beginning, this is just one example of a highly entangled state of matter. Um, it's sort of the most uh, uh, exotic of, of these uh, known spin liquid states. Um, a way, one way to think about the spin on Fermi surface state is to just start with a Fermi, uh, a Fermi gas of electrons uh, and apply a Goodsfeller projection operator, which uh, uh, enforces that there's only one uh, electron for every site. Um, um, this uh, state is actually, despite being very exotic seeming, is one of the most uh, commonly proposed states uh, to be, uh, that might be realized in various experimental systems. If you're a real aficionado of spin on Fermi surfaces, uh, like, like this fellow here, um, uh, you have suggested it in, in all of these systems. Um, uh, so now let's, let's uh, go back to try to actually look at this correlation function. What's a basic theoretical description is a field theory of, uh, of these spin-ons uh, coupled to an emergent gauge field. So it's going to have a, a kinetic energy. Uh, the, they see a, a capital A here is the emergent gauge field, and we're going to include the effects of this Zeeman field, which introduces a spin splitting. So sigma will be a spin Pauli matrix. So the energy of an up spin is lower than the energy of a down spin uh, by a magnetic field over two. Um, the gauge field uh, is governed by this Landau damped action, uh, where this Landau damping arises self-consistently from the fermions, but we're just going to take it as a given here. Um, and one additional ingredient I want to include you notice I did not include the time component of the gauge field in this uh, quadratic term. Um, that's because, uh, because it's a metallic system, there's very strong screening of the density-density interactions. Uh, it means that those, those type of interactions generated by the time component are effectively local. Uh, and so we can replace that by just a short range interaction uh, between uh, fermions. Okay, so this is an extremely well-studied problem. Uh, uh, by many, many people, though mostly in the situation of zero Zeeman field. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I can't possibly list even everyone on the panel who's worked on this. So, um, nevertheless, let's take a very simple approach um, and ask, uh, okay, suppose we neglect the interactions between these spin-ons. Uh, what, uh, uh, what should this dynamical susceptibility look like? Um, so first in zero magnetic field, uh, the dynamical susceptibility is just uh, a measurement of particle hole excitations. That's a spin operator. Uh, uh, to raise a, the spin, what you do is you remove a down electron and you create an up electron, a down spin on and create an up spin on. Um, so uh, if we have a, a momentum which is smaller than twice the Fermi momentum, then there's an excitation available at arbitrarily low energy. You can take uh, you can, for example, remove uh, uh, in zero magnetic field, you can remove an electron below the Fermi surface and add it just above the Fermi surface with any momentum like the one here that spans the Fermi surface. Um, uh, on the other hand, there's a maximum energy you can achieve at that fixed momentum, which is removing the electron just inside the Fermi surface and taking the one you add as far away as possible. So this generates a sort of familiar curve uh, of the two particle continuum that you'll find in textbooks. If you apply a magnetic field, this is how the continuum changes at, at small momentum and energy. Um, at zero momentum, you have to make a vertical transition. So you have to take a, a, a fermion, which has downspin at a given momentum and move it to an upspin uh, state at the same momentum. And you need the downspin to be uh, occupied and the upspin state to be empty. But those states are split by the Zeeman energy. And so uh, you know, this can only occur at exactly the Zeeman energy. Uh, on the other hand, if we want to make a zero energy excitation, we have to provide at least enough momentum to move from the smaller uh, minority Fermi surface to the uh, larger majority Fermi surface. So zero momentum weight only occurs past a certain momentum, which is basically the same in energy divided by the Fermi velocity. And so the, the two particle continuum lives in here. Um, so this is what it should look like for free fermions and actually was suggested uh, a couple of years ago that this was actually observed in some particular material. Uh, 
Uh, but here we want to ask, is this even the correct expectation? Um, so uh, because of the Larmor theorem, I told you before, you might think this is looking pretty good. Uh, we know, in fact, at zero momentum uh, that uh, this is an exact result, that there's a delta function at the Zeeman energy. And so, it, well, it's not too surprising that free particles, they satisfy the theorem, they should give that result. But it suggests that interactions don't make much a difference at zero momentum um, in this low momentum regime. That turns out not to be true. Um, so what are the effects? So I already mentioned there are basically two types of interactions we need to worry about between these spin-ons. Uh, one is the, just the density-density interaction, and the other is the transverse part. Uh, what's uh, interesting for this study is actually that the density-density part is the most important part. Um, and it's kind of easy to understand uh, what it does. So it, it just, uh, we just consider this short-range interaction. Imagine we apply a magnetic field so that there are a few more up electrons and down, or up fermions and down. So the, uh, this uh, up electron density or fermion density, pardon me, uh, has a different average than the downspin density. So the up fermion density generates uh, a small shift in the chemical potential of the down fermions. And vice versa, the downspin density generates a small shift in the chemical potential of the up fermions. But those shifts are not equal, and so that is effectively a change in the Zeeman energy. Um, alternatively, we can consider this as just a Hartree self-energy correction. What it does is it actually shifts the energy of a quasi-particle from the bare Zeeman energy up to an energy which is proportional to the interaction times the magnetization. Um, so this is a, a non-zero fraction of the Zeeman energy, order one fraction, typically. Um, so now there's a problem uh, a priori. So the, the true quasi-particles, once you include the self-energy correction, uh, actually have their, uh, uh, their two-particle continuum at the wrong energy. It's too high to satisfy the Larmor theorem. So what's the resolution? Well, the resolution must be that because the Larmor theorem is exact, that actually the delta function at the Zeeman energy is not the two particle continuum, it comes from a collective mode. Uh, and so uh, to treat it, one has to really also include diagrammatically, not just the self energy, but vertex corrections in the spin spin correlation function. And I'll, I'll spare you kind of details of how that works, but you can do it via kind of RPA like procedure. Um, and what this shows uh, is that, uh, Indeed, uh, if you compute this RPA self-energy um, at small momentum, uh, there's a collective mode whose energy is exactly the Zeeman energy. Uh, and uh, it uh, lies below the continuum. And actually, um, at small momentum, this, uh, so this is kind of a bound state of an electron and hole. That really is the thing that gives, satisfies the Larmor theorem. And it contains all the spectral weight. Um, this spectral weight gets suppressed by that interaction and goes to zero at, at that point. Um, so this is actually analogous to something uh, studied in ferromagnets by Seelin. Uh, finally, a word about the gauge field interaction. Um, uh, this is really the thing which makes uh, the spin-on Fermi surface very different from, a, uh, from an ordinary electron gas. It turns out not to play a, a huge role at small momentum, um, but it, it does lead to spectral weight outside in these nominally forbidden regions. And you might worry that it will give a lifetime, really broaden out this collective mode. Uh, we know it can't ruin it too badly because we still have to satisfy the Larmor theorem. Um, basically what it does is creates a sort of shake off process that uh, our spin excitation, uh, spin flip operator can create a, a, a three particle excitation, an electron and a hole plus a, a photon in this emergent gauge field. And uh, what you can show uh, following uh, techniques worked out by Youngbeck Kim and his collaborators back when I was a grad student um, in the ancient past, uh, that this leads to a, um, a very small uh, but not analytic spectral weight that vanishes as Q goes to zero. That's really true because of the Larmor theorem um, and with this funny power of uh, frequency. So there's actually no gap in here. There's spectral weight everywhere, but it's weak enough that this mode is still very well defined. Um, so that's kind of a summary here. Um, what I want to stress is that there's a splitting of actually two spectral features uh, in the susceptibility uh, that's non-zero uh, as the momentum goes to zero. And that splitting is a direct measure of interactions. It's proportional to the interaction between these spin-ons. Uh, so if you can measure that splitting, you've directly measured the fact that the spin-ons interact. Um, so Shamit, how am I doing? What, how much time? 
Um, you have uh, 20 minutes that would get you through your entire question session or 10 minutes for your talk. Okay, all right. Well, I'll try to move somewhat quickly. Um, so, uh, you know, spin on Fermi surface is a very interesting state for many of us. It's one of the most uh, sought after and, and maybe likely to find quantum spin liquid states. Um, but, you know, you, if you are skeptical enough, you might worry uh, that some of the approximations in the previous part might not be correct. Um, uh, what we realized more recently after doing this study is that the same ideas apply to actually one dimensional spin chains, uh, where, as I mentioned before, we can really test everything. Um, so uh, this is something I'd like to tell you about now, and it's, it's in this archive paper. Uh, so to, to have a concrete model in mind, let's consider a 1D uh, J1, J2 chain of spin one half spins in a magnetic field B. So both interactions will take to be antiferromagnetic. If J2 is zero, this is a famous beta chain, the Heisenberg spin chain that, that beta solved exactly in 1931. Um, it uh, describes a gapless, uh, if you want, spin liquid phase in one dimension. It has power law correlations of various types. Um, that gapless phase is stable. If you apply a small uh, second neighbor interaction, it just extends into an entire phase uh, until you get to a, a, a large enough J2, about a quarter uh, of J1, where it undergoes a transition to a dimerized gapped phase. Um, uh, and there's a, so this is sort of the phase diagram. Uh, the gapless phase has a lot of descriptions. I'll, I'll spare you all the different possible ways of thinking about it. Um, it really is at, at low energies. It's described by a, a SU2 level one conformal field theory. Um, there are many ways to represent that. Uh, for our purposes, uh, what's, we'll use a way which allows us to connect to the uh, fermion description of the, of the previous part of the talk. We can represent that gapless state via free fermions. So this uh, is familiar from studies of one dimensional uh, spin chains. You can decompose the spin operator into uh, kind of slowly varying spin currents plus a staggered magnetization field. Um, because we'll be studying phenomena mostly at zero momentum, all we re will really need here are the uh, spin currents and they are faithfully represented as bilinears of uh, right and left moving fermions. Um, at the conformal field theory limit, the uh, valid at, at low enough energies, uh, the Hamiltonian for these fermions is just free Dirac fermions um, uh, with some velocity V. Um, uh, importantly, there's a, a marginal perturbation, which is a, a backscattering, usually called in condensed matter, or a right-left current, uh, current term, which violates a conformal symmetry. Um, and of course, we can, uh, it's just the product of the right and left moving currents, and we can write it in terms of diagonal and raising and lowering terms. Um, um, so uh, this backscattering term is not conformally invariant, so it flows uh, under renormalization. And what we know is that for the uh, beta chain and, and in the entire region in which the gapless phase is stable, it's marginally irrelevant. So it flows uh, on the top here. I've now added a sort of flow diagram for this parameter G. When G is positive uh, on this side, it flows down to zero. Uh, when it's negative, it flows off to large values and that signals the instability to the dimerized phase. So anywhere in this stable region, uh, the, this uh, G term is uh, marginally irrelevant. Um, I should point out that if we were to write J in terms of fermions, it's this G term, which is a four fermion interaction. So it looks rather similar uh, to the four fermion interaction we saw earlier. Um, so if, if you believe that it's marginally irrelevant, the, the standard approach would be to say, well, let's just ignore it completely at low energies. It doesn't have any effects. This actually was taken in uh, uh, a number of seminal papers uh, by uh, Oshikawa and Affleck who are interested in the dynamical spin susceptibility. Here's a sketch from their paper. Uh, this is what happens if you treat the fermions as free and calculate the dynamical spin susceptibility. You find that this, uh, this uh, resonance uh, delta function at zero momentum extends into just two lines um, that come out uh, at a slope given by the, uh, this uh, Dirac velocity. But if you actually look at numerical studies, so here's a numerical study from uh, 11 years ago, um, and look closely, uh, here's some data at uh, one eighth of saturation magnetization, uh, one fourth actually, you can see that there are two line-like features uh, in the uh, 
in the spectra, but they don't actually come into the same point. You can see actually they're separated by some gap. Uh, we saw that and thought, wow, this is something very similar to our uh, previous work. Maybe the same physics is going on here. I'll spare you this slide. There's other indications in literature going back 20 plus years, um, but this uh, feature was never really noticed. Um, so uh, the, the key point here is that uh, at zero magnetic field, indeed this backscattering is marginally irrelevant, but the magnetic field sets a lower energy cutoff. Um, once we uh, renormalize down to the energy of the Zeeman energy, we need to worry about the effects of the magnetic field. Uh, they're going to be non-zero. It won't have renormalized all the way to zero. In fact, it will only have a pretty weak logarithmic correction. Um, and, and because of that, uh, we need to take these interaction effects into account. So it's sort of convenient to separate, uh, as we did in the spin liquid case, these interactions into their kind of longitudinal effects. We can just write the, the coupling between the Z components of the currents and the spin flip effects. So these longitudinal effects, uh, they, they are, you know, once we uh, apply a magnetization, apply a magnetic field, it generates a magnetization, it generates a difference in the expectation value of these right and left moving spin currents, um, difference of expectation value of JZ, non-zero expectation of JZ, excuse me. Uh, it effectively enhances the uh, Zeeman field uh, by a factor of G times the magnetization. Um, these uh, raising and lowering operators, they're less obvious what they do. Uh, but they will give a sort of vertex correction. Um, and what we can do is a very simple, again, RPA-like calculation. I can explain how it works uh, if, if anyone is interested, um, which gives a, a, a way to take uh, into account these, uh, this interaction uh, to a sort of leading order. Uh, so we can, from this, express the, uh, uh, the current, current correlation functions. That's what this G is uh, in terms of the bare current current correlation functions. Um, and here's a result. I don't intend you to, to parse it entirely, um, uh, but we can look at this plot here. I think it contains most of the information. So here is omega versus K again. Uh, the dashed lines are what we would have if we neglect uh, this backscattering interaction. As Oshikao and Affleck saw, there's a, a just a, a lines of delta function singularities um, in, the, in the dynamical susceptibility. Uh, what happens is these, uh, uh, at zero momentum, these two uh, lines get split. There's a non-zero uh, optical splitting, which is proportional to the strength of the interaction and proportional to the magnetization. Um, so again, there's a splitting, which is a direct measure of how strong interactions between these fermionic spin-ons are. Um, moreover, uh, the bottom branch is something more like a bound state. In particular, these A's here are the spectral weight. The red branch contains all the spectral weight at, as momentum goes to zero, and the upper branch has vanishing spectral weight. And that's how the Larmor theorem is satisfied. Um, so Anna uh, is an expert in uh, matrix product state-based uh, calculations in 1D spin systems, and she was able to actually calculate the dynamical spin susceptibility uh, for this J1, J2 chain. Um, so here are some calculations shown uh, at, a, at a small non-zero magnetic field um, for two different values of J2. This is just the nearest neighbor Heisenberg chain. And here is J2 uh, very close to this uh, quantum critical point between the gapless and dimerized phase. Um, so in, in the top picture, you see uh, actually this nice splitting and two branches. You can also make out that the bottom branch is more intense than the upper branch. Uh, this line is actually a fit to that formula uh, I showed you that came from this RPA calculation. In the bottom plot where J2 is larger, uh, it looks uh, almost like uh, the non-interacting spin-on result. And indeed, uh, remember that the, this quantum phase transition occurs exactly at the point where G changes sign from positive to negative. So tuning close to this critical point corresponds to G approximately zero. Now we can also look at the spectral weight of these uh, peaks at different momenta uh, and see uh, that they're rather consistent with that story. Um, if you take a lot of this data uh, from measurements at, at different J2 and different magnetization, you can plot the splitting of the two optical modes as a function of the magnetization for different values of J2 over J1, um, fit it to this quadratic function of magnetization. Remember the theory tells us the lead, leading order term in magnetization and there's a higher order correction we expect uh, just from analyticity. Uh, this fit allows us to extract G, 
um, which uh, you know, a priori is a, a parameter that depends on J2 over J1. And uh, you can see that it extrapolates to zero uh, at a point of around 0.24, uh, which is the known point of the quantum phase transition for the uh, J1, J2 chain. So this is a pretty nice confirmation that everything is very consistent with what we know about uh, this chain. Uh, so I'm almost finished, but I want to point out one other interesting uh, quasi-particle interaction phenomena that we didn't really expect coming into this. Uh, you know, because Anna is pretty fast at these simulations, uh, the previous theory, uh, analytical theory, really applied to small magnetization and small magnetic fields. Um, at large magnetization, uh, there's very different physics, and in particular, when the magnetization is close to saturation, uh, things become very similar to the simple magnons I talked about before. The ground state is just a simple field, po field polarized state, and there is no way for there to be a lot of quantum fluctuations around to create exotic quasi-particles. Um, what Anna saw is that uh, when we, she went to large magnetizations, these are sort of the plots at the bottom uh, part of this, uh, uh, of this graph of many data, uh, uh, many data sets, um, that uh, this splitting uh, at zero momentum did not vanish um, even when we went to this nominally non-interacting limit. That was a clue that we need to think about a uh, different sort of quasi-particle uh, rather than spin-ons. Um, so here is, here is uh, two, uh, uh, two of these data sets at 90% of saturation magnetization. So spins are almost completely polarized. Here it is for the Heisenberg chain and here it is for the uh, J1, J2 chain very close to this uh, quantum critical point that occurs in zero field. Uh, so one thing you can notice is there are again two modes in the limit as K goes to zero. One of them contains all the intensity, which it has to because of the Larmor theorem. Uh, the other one goes to zero. Um, and uh, moreover, there's a splitting between these two modes and it's non-zero for both cases. Um, another feature you might notice is that this lower mode actually is sort of doubled, has some funny splitting in it. Um, so what's going on here? The way you should think about this system is it's very close to full magnetization. And the full magnetization, the quasi-particles are very simple. They're just magnons. Indeed, if you were to calculate this dynamical susceptibility uh, when the magnetization is fully polarized, it'll just contain a single mode that has all the spectral weight. Uh, it's because there's an exact eigenstate, which just consists of flipping one spin. Uh, that was what was shown in this little movie cartoon earlier. Um, uh, if we look at 90% of saturation, you'll see that the bottom mode kind of mirrors that. It's almost the same as what we'd have at, at full saturation. So this is some sort of descendant of the magnon. What's, what's rather funny is there's, a, there's actually another mode here that uh, goes up to energies of you know something like twice the energy of the original magnon. Um, uh, and uh, the fact that this whole no, new mode appears when I do a small amount of doping, so you, if a feature appears at much higher energy, even when I introduce a very small perturbation to the ground state, uh, is something somewhat interesting. Um, so a picture you can have for this is, uh, is a very simple one. In this high magnetization limit, we should think of the, the system as being like a, a gas of dilute spin flips. So each spin flip here maps to a particle um, and the, the upspins are just vacancies. So these spin flips move around. If we come into our ground state, which is a superposition of different spatial configurations like this, and we, we uh, lower the spin somewhere, we've added an additional spin flip. So this spin flip we added could be a propagating particle. However, if it happens to be close to one of the existing spin flips, it can bind to it if those two particles interact. Um, so this is the physics that leads to that other branch. Uh, if the quasi-particles, these magnons, interact, uh, then uh, we can see bound states um, uh, of these magnons. And uh, you know, for time's sake, I won't, uh, I won't explain how this works, but there's a rather simple calculation of it, um, which shows uh, that actually we can obtain this, uh, this higher energy feature. So here we've zoomed in on it so you can see it more clearly this second branch in the spectral function um, uh, by a very simple two-particle Schrodinger equation. Um, so this dashed line is not a fit, it's just a calculation. We're able to match it exactly, and we know how the spectral weight behaves. It's just proportional to the uh, deviation from full saturation. So something like this was known for the Heisenberg chain. Uh, these are related to beta onsatz string states in, uh, in the beta onsatz. But this phenomena is more general. It occurs uh, for any value of J2. Generically, that model's not integrable. There's no beta onsatz when J2 is non-zero. 
but we can calculate it just as well here. Uh, Leon, you're, you're five minutes into your question session, so there's five okay. minutes left. I'm, this is, I think, my second to last slide. So um, this is uh, just before conclusion. So um, uh, the point to make here is that in this, in this limit, uh, it's actually the, uh, the spectral weight of this upper, uh, upper branch of excitations that's related to interactions. And you can check that by studying the XX model, which uh, is exactly equivalent to free fermions, and you can see it, it doesn't have this upper branch at all. Uh, so let me just stop with my summary slide and um, take any questions that there might be. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so we have just a few minutes for questions. If any of the panelists or um, if you're an audience member and have a question, type it into the Q&A. Oh, I have a question, but should I type first? Yeah. Okay, uh, hi, Leon. Uh, so uh, with regards to um, the applicability of Larmor's theorem, uh, one needs to have rotational symmetries. So to what extent are um, those things necessary to see these things in real materials? Of course, we don't have rotational symmetry in, in real materials. To, so what, to what extent are your conclusions sensitive to uh, breaking of rotational symmetries? Yeah, well, some of the, so. Yeah, so which ones? Some of them are, are certainly sensitive. So the, you know, the exact location of this uh, collective mode at zero momentum is determined by Larmor's theorem. If it's violated, it will move. Um, in general, when you violate spin rotation symmetry, you, you can pick up a lifetime for that mode. Um, but, uh, but the fact that the, that the zero momentum excitation is, is not really a, a, you know, a free quasi-particle excitation, but is a collective mode in, in most of these systems, I think that's a very robust feature. Um, and uh, it's certainly, in the 1D case, it's certainly robust. We can calculate it equally well there where we can test things. Um, so I, I know for, for, for cyclotron resonance in Cohn's theorem that it depends very sensitively on having Galilean symmetry. So all of these vertex corrections, which are basically required, you know, to get these kind of exact cancellations where you get the, the, uh, the bare mass, they just kind of, they just go away the moment you... Uh, I mean, that's what it looks like from theory in metals with cyclotron resonance. Yeah, yeah. So the you end up renormalizing the mass quite easily. It will renormalize the location of the resonance, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, so that that's the analog of the mass is the the frequency, you know, the ratio yeah. of the frequency of the resonance to the magnetic field. So it's very much like that. Um, okay. Thanks. Sure. Okay. So we have some uh, some ringers in the attendees who are asking questions. Um, so here's a question from Una Kim. Would these provide evidence of spin-ons? Would these provide evidence of spin-ons? Um, I would turn it around. It's a good question. Uh, you know, the uh, one typically tries to turn use the continuum as evidence of spin-ons. Um, and the and the the way to make that comparison, the problem with continua, try to compare continua to data, is that continua. Are, are not so easy to characterize. It's, it's hard to make a good quantitative comparison of continua to, to experimental data. Um, and uh, that comparison is gonna be flawed if you try to make a detailed numerical comparison between free quasi-particle continua and the, the true interacting one. Um, so we need an understanding of the spin-on interactions in order to make that an honest comparison. Okay. Um, so I think it's a, a crucial ingredient in trying to actually identify spin-ons via dynamical correlations, um, uh, but it's, uh, it's only that. Um, okay. okay, there's another ringer in the audience. Leo Radzohovsky asks, why is the bound state upper branch above the lower branch even though it's a bound state? Uh, it's below. Where, where are you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It isn't. Uh, Answer is it isn't. Uh, <laughs> okay, and here's a question from Colin Rylands. Taking account of band curvature is often very important in calculating the dynamic susceptibility in one dimension, but it is absent from your calculation. Do you expect it to play a role here? Right. Um, so what I probably should have said something about is there's a, uh, uh, this is, you know, connected to but distinct from a, a long thread of study uh, that uh, is extremely interesting in 1D systems, which is trying to understand the details of the threshold singularities in these dynamical correlation functions. 
Um, so there are various predictions that are made just based on Luttinger liquid theory for low energy singularities, um, describing these 1D spin chains by free bosons, for example. Um, and it's known that corrections to that arising, among other things, from curvature of the, uh, of the underlying fermion states uh, are very important at understanding the behavior at threshold. Um, we're not asking about such a thing, actually. Um, we're, we're studying something much simpler, which is uh, really not a low energy uh, question at all, but uh, the behavior in the vicinity of this uh, kind of Larmor resonance. Um, I don't think we claim to understand the exact nature of the threshold singularities. There are branches coming out of these, uh, both the upper and lower branch uh, coming out of the features at, at zero momenta. Um, each of those will have threshold singularities. They're not really delta functions, um, and that's not contained in our treatment. Um, but as you can see, you know, they, they're still rather narrow. Um, it matches quite well to, um, to these uh, dynamical, numerically exact dynamical calculations in 1D. I, I think it would be an interesting problem for the future to try to put those ideas together. Okay, we have time only for one more question. Um, I will ask the question that Tarun Grover is asking in the Q&A, which is, what are the implications for YBMG GA04, the spin liquid candidate? <laughs> uh, yeah, he saw the, okay. Um, <laughs> I don't think I want to make a, a strong claim there. Uh, so uh, I, that, that's actually a very controversial uh, experimental system. Um, you know, probably the prevailing point of view in, in that material is that uh, uh, there's a complicated interplay of disorder and, uh, and spin liquid physics going on. Um, the, I think the resolution of that data is probably not enough to resolve uh, the, the physics here. Um, that's my sense. Uh, the point I wanted to make is that the Experimentalists themselves uh, tried to explain their data by comparison with this free spin-on theory. Um, and, uh, you know, our calculations show that, you know, you shouldn't expect it to agree with the free spin-on theory because interactions have qualitatively uh, dramatic effects on the, on the actual dynamical susceptibility. So that comparison is flawed. Um, whether, uh, you know, what that implies for this actual ground state of that system in, in such applied magnetic fields, for example, is a different question. Okay, thank you, Leon. Um, I think, could you unshare now and 